of that too. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sylvia Liska, and on behalf of the Friends of the Secession, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the exhibition talk between Peter Doig and Matthew Higgs. Since we have only one hour before the opening of the three exhibitions by Martin Sims, Fernanda Gomez, and Peter Doig at 7 p.m., I hope for your understanding that there will be no time for questions after the talk. However, all artists are present and will be happy to talk to you in the course of the evening. As another aside, you know that the acoustics at the session are famously, famously bad. So if you stand, don't stand on the side, stand towards the back, then you will hear more and better. Peter Doig was born in 1959 in Edinburgh and was raised in Trinidad and Canada before moving to London to study painting. He currently divides his time living and working in Trinidad, London, and New York. Over his career, his work has been shown and collected by the most prestigious international art institutions. It was Peter Doig who suggested Matthew Higgs as part in conversation, and we are so happy that you, Matthew, accepted our invitation. Matthew Higgs is an artist, writer, and curator based in New York. He is currently the director and chief curator of White Columns, New York's oldest alternative space. Over the past 20 years, he has curated and organized more than 200 exhibitions and projects with artists in Europe and North America, and his writings have been published widely. Higgs and Doig have been friends since the early 1990s and have collaborated on a number of projects since then. Peter's relationship to Vienna is a long-standing one. In 1999, he had spent several months working here. This was the time when he discovered Das Haus der Bilder, 1994, really, okay. <laughs> this was the time he discovered Das Haus der Bilder on Breitegasse. It was supposed to become an important source for his work for some years. This may have also been the time, I'm asking you, that you met your Viennese collaborator and friend, the recently deceased Peter Reich, yes, who mounted and stretched all his paintings. His company still does today. <laughs> One of his monumental landscape paintings has been exhibited recently in Jasper Sharp's exhibition, The Shape of Time at the Kunsthistorische Museum. It has since found a permanent home at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was high time that an exhibition of Peter Doig's work can be seen by the Austrian public. We are so honored and proud that it is taking place here at the Secession. Peter and Matthew. <laughs> Peter and Matthew, I thank you so much for your generosity in having this public conversation for our benefit. I know it can be torture too. We are very much looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. And thanks, obviously, to everybody for coming. It's great to see so many people here. Um, yeah, as Sylvia said, myself and Peter have known each other since 1992, I think, so we're celebrating our 27th anniversary. <laughs> and um, also, as Sylvia said, that Peter was born in 1959 in Edinburgh, uh, but moved before the age of one to um, Trinidad. Just over the age of two. So, as a very young child, moved to Trinidad, and thus begins an ongoing story that we'll come back to later. In 1966, Peter moves from Trinidad to Canada, 
uh, which is a place that I think remains strongly associated with his work, and especially the work he made in the 1990s. 1979, Peter moved to London to study first at Wimbledon School of Art, and then at St. Martin's uh, School of Art, and then moved back to Canada in 1986 to Montreal, and in 1989 moved back to London to study for an MA at Chelsea School of Art. I met Peter in 1992 uh, when we were both in an exhibition together called Inside a Microcosm at Lord Geniard's Gallery in London that was curated by Gareth Jones. Um, and in 1993, myself and Peter curated our first ever exhibition, uh, the work of Billy Childish, uh, who remains a lifetime friend for both of us, at a space in London called Cubit where Peter had a studio. So that's a quick biographical sketch of Peter's early life and when we met. Um, Peter first started showing in galleries in 1994 uh, with Victoria Miro in London, Gavin Brown in New York, and then the year later, Contemporary Fine Arts in Berlin. Uh, in 1994, he was also nominated for the Turner Prize. And in a previous conversation uh, I had with Peter, uh, I was surprised how little Peter had actually done when he was nominated for the Turner Prize. He'd almost not exhibited at all. <laughs> uh, in 1994, Peter's, I think your connection with Austria begins, you won the Carrion Prize in Salzburg with Herbert Randall. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, and there was a two-person show with the prize? There was a two-person show together, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that one of the things that was interesting for me, at least in the, in the 1990s, was the reception of Peter's work in the German-speaking world. So Sylvia says this exhibition is Peter's first solo exhibition in Austria. But between 1996 and 1999, there were survey exhibitions of Peter's work in Bremen, Kiel, Nuremberg, and Glarus. Then in, between 2004 and 2005 in Munich, Hanover, Cologne, and Zurich and between 2006 and 2009 in Leipzig and Frankfurt. Uh, so there's been an extraordinary ongoing historical response to your work in German-speaking countries. So the first question is, <laughs> why is that? <laughs> oh, God. Um, or why do you think that is? Why do I think that is? Uh... I suppose there is um, a curiosity um, and I suppose lack of narrow-mindedness when it came to painting in this part of the world that possibly existed in, the, in London and um, I'm not going to say New York because I didn't really go to New York in those days but certainly in the UK at the time when I was first painting and I think that um, there was, um, yeah, it was definitely a curiosity. Um, I, <clears throat> a little story, we made a, the first exhibition I made in Germany was um, in, with Contemporary Fine Arts in Berlin and um, Peter Wilberg, who designed this catalog for this show, designed my first book, which was a very simple little publication, um, but quite an unusual one. Um, and it was sent out to a number of people and uh, that the response to that publication was was uh, surprising. I think, um, well, to me especially, but I think to to the gallerist as well. Really, I think, um, yeah, as I said, there was a there was a genuine curiosity for the type of paintings I was making that I hadn't really experienced prior to that. And were you were you specifically looking at German painting at that time or before? No, not really. I mean, I was looking. Um, had all sorts of painting, but uh, not specifically German. But I think one significant thing about the interest in the German-speaking museum world in the 1990s was that it really amplified the fact that your work escaped the attention of the YBA phenomena and everything and all the baggage that came with that. And I think you know it's it's to your the work's eternal credit that you were never caught up in the the noise of the YBA that distorted, I think, not only British art, but the reception of British art abroad. <laughs> well, I think I was probably a little bit too old. 
Um, I was probably about five years too old, and I think five years at that time probably mattered quite a bit. Um, also, um, I don't think there was really a place for, um, you know, the type of painting I was making within that world, even though it was a fairly, fairly broad spectrum of work, I guess. Um, in 2000, which really brings us into the, the story that relates to tonight's exhibition, uh, you visited Trinidad on a residency. 2000? 2000, yeah. Um, and if I remember correctly, on that trip, you went with your friend, the artist Chris Ophelia? I did. Um, it was Chris Ophelia, Lisa Bryce, who's... Um, here tonight. Here tonight. Um, and another artist called Andrew Miller, who's a Scottish artist. And if I remember rightly, did you buy some land on that trip? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did, yes. This isn't going on the internet. <laughs> I bought a small piece of land. I mean, I, I lived in Trinidad, as Matthew said, um, when I was a child, but I hadn't been back in 33 years. And I think it was about in the last two days I was there, I saw a, a small ad in the paper, and um, I ended up buying a very small piece of land, which kept me going back. Well, yeah, the only reason I mention it is that it seems kind of remarkable thing to do, that you go somewhere for a while on a residency and two days before you leave, you decide to buy a piece of land. Yeah. It's very small. <laughs> <laughs> so I re guess really the reason I mention it tonight is that, you know, in 2000, you'd been in Trinidad between the ages of two and six, I think, and now 20 years on from 2000, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, can you say what happened to you during that residency? I mean, did the Trinidad of 2000 somehow resonate or reanimate your childhood spent there or some relationship you had with the place? I mean, what happened in 2000 that reconfigured this relationship with mm. a very specific place? Well, I think that... Um I was nervous going back. I was nervous going. I didn't know what the reception would be to, you know, a white artist going back post, in post-independence post times. And um, I, thought, um, I thought maybe it might be treated in a kind of hostile way. I had no idea because I didn't really know the, I, I, I no longer knew the place. Um, and I was surprised when I got there by, um, you know, how welcome, I was, not just me, but the other artists as well. And um, I felt that it was an, a really sort of exciting city. I mean, I can only really think of, for instance, like in the very early 80s, going on a college trip to, to Barcelona and thinking, wow, this is an ex exceptionally exciting place. I could imagine coming here and being inspired by here. I never was. I was only there for a week. But Trinidad, I had this connection with. And the city of Port of Spain, um, particularly, I found um, exciting. And um, I thought this is an alternate place that I kind of, that I actually know quite well and I remember quite strongly that I could live in. And also, um, I thought that my young children um, could possibly share the experience that I had when I was a child, which I think was um, a very sort of powerful and uh, informative one that never left me. Um, in 2002, so two years after visiting for the residency, you moved to Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And you'd worked in London for the previous decade. The, the paintings that you'd made and were celebrated for uh, were made in London. Uh, almost all of them, I think, were made in London. When you arrived in Trinidad in 2002, having moved there, uh, was it difficult to start working again? Well, not really, because um, when I went on the residency in 2000, my work changed profoundly. I mean, I, I pretty much altered all the paintings I was working on in London when I came back, and they all kind of were afflicted by my time in Trinidad. Um, I exhibited them at, uh, in a show in 2002, just prior to, to moving to Trinidad, but they had all sort of, they all, well, except for the House to Builder painting, which was the Viennese painting, pretty much all the paintings had some sort of Trinidad 
um, you know, subject or influence in them. And then another reason I thought Trinidad would be an interesting place to go at that time was I'd been offered an exhibition um, in Munich at the Pinnock Attack, and I, I was starting to think about making this body of work, and I thought, well, go for two or three years, make this body of work, and then maybe come back, but then never left. I mean, you, you just said that, you know, your, your work at that time around 2000, 2001 changed profoundly as, as a result of the experience of being in Trinidad. I mean, what, what would, how would you characterize something changing profoundly? Well, I think that, you know, in my own um, time painting, I think you go through, you go through um, phases. And uh, there was a phase where I was, you know, deeply influenced by having lived in Canada and things to do with maybe not so much Canada, but the outdoors um, in the work. And um, I think that another phase started when I returned to Trinidad and um, I felt that a whole new... Um, not just subject, but sort of also way of working started. Um, new imagery, imagery that um, I could almost never have imagined using in my paintings prior to that. Because um, you had a retrospective at Tate Britain in 2008, and um, the final room of that retrospective included paintings uh, made in Trinidad, but also with Trinidadian subjects. I'm thinking of the, the painting of the amber the bat dressed painting. as the bat at Carnival. And um, I think, you know, as you just mentioned, I think one of the things that characterized your work in the 1990s and certainly the way that the work was discussed, that you were making paintings in a studio in central London, but the paintings almost always depicted somewhere else and elsewhere, whether mm -hmm. it was the Canada of your adolescence Whereas I think what seems to have happened, and especially over the last decade, and, and it's especially pertinent to the paintings that are here tonight, um, you're referring directly to tr Trinidadian subjects, and the paintings are made in Trinidad too. Um, mm. Can you say something about this shift, where in London you were thinking about elsewhere, whereas now working in Trinidad, you're very specifically thinking about place, locality, your relationship with that place, autobiography, paintings that are observational of Trinidadian uh, landscapes. Um, well, I think it's, it, it, I think if I think back on my time painting in London, there was only small periods of time where I actually painted London subjects, very few London subjects. And um, I don't know whether it was to do with the type of um, Places, places I worked. I mean, I, I, I loved London and I loved working in London, um, but I never really found my... I don't, wouldn't consider myself to be a kind of London painter in a way, in the way that certain artists are very much London, regardless of their painters or not. Um, I don't know, I just think that it was probably just the effect of going to Trinidad and just um, feeling such a sort of inspiration for what I was experiencing that... Um, that led to that change. I mean, I can't really say why exactly, but it felt, it felt comfortable. Because uh, this morning there was a, a press viewing of the exhibition, and you touched on this to one of the questions from the press, but which was around how, uh, the idea of how, how do you negotiate a sense of being an observer of Trinidadian life, or even though you've lived there now for more than 25 years of your own life. And I think the question this morning was phrased in the idea that you remain a kind of outsider. Yes, I mean, definitely. Um, and we'll never be an insider, really. <laughs> um, but that's probably the case um, throughout my life in all the different places I've lived. Right. But I think more profoundly so in a society like Trinidad, which is, you know, 50% African pretty much, and the other 50% being Indian. And so I feel like an outsider. Having said that, I think that some of my children are certainly not outsiders because they were either born there or spent pretty much their whole lives there. Um, but I, um, because of my age and my, you know, the amount of time I spent there and the time abroad, 
I will always be an outsider, but I think maybe that's not, su not such a bad place to be as um, an artist, maybe. Does, does that status give you a sense of freedom in the work, or does it inhibit the process, or both? Um, well, I mean, I think I try and challenge myself to be more, um, you know, take on subjects that maybe I shouldn't, um, or, 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 or awkward. Um, other times it's more questioning, really. Because um, I, I think one of the amazing things that you did when you, after, shortly after you arrived and moved in Trinidad, is that with the artist, Trinidadian artist Shay Lovelace, you set up a weekly film club in your studio, uh, studio film club, um, showing films that weren't in distribution in Trinidad or the Caribbean. But that it also functioned, it transformed the studio into a social space and created a community around the studio and the studio complex, and in a strange way created a kind of community around yourself and your practice. I mean, can you say something about the motives for Studio Film Club and how it related to working there? Well, I think that um, when I moved there, I didn't really know very many people, very many artists, and uh, I went to certain events, and I was always thinking, like, where do these people go when this event's not happening, for instance. And uh, there was a film festival um, that no longer exists uh, that was on shortly after we arrived in Trinidad, and they were showing, um, you know, regional films. And one of them was a documentary about the making of the classic Jamaican film, The Harder They Come. This, is, this was in 2002. And I sort of thought to myself, I wonder how many people at this point in time of a certain generation had actually seen that film. Because this, there was no cinemas that would show it. It wasn't available in DV, on DVD in the, on the island, and it certainly wouldn't have been shown on TV. TV. So I mentioned to my friend Che, I, I said, well, why don't we try a screening of our own in my studio? I had this, um, this quite large space that I'd been given to use for, for free, actually. So I had this big sort of warehouse space, and we borrowed you know, basic equipment to do a screening, and uh, we were surprised that you know, 50 people turned up. And uh, we, it just sort of snowballed from there, really, and um, became a weekly thing. I think we, over, the, over eight years, we did you know, close to 400 screenings. And some nights we'd have almost as many people as this in there crammed in to see films that, um, that weren't otherwise going to be screened. Things have changed now that people can stream movies and things like that. But at the time, it was really it was the only place where you'd see certain things. And um, it was a good, it was a good, it was a good scene, and it was called Studio Film Club, not because it was exclusive, but because it kind of evolved from the screening of films into a club-like situation. People would stay and, you know, talk and listen to music and what have you. And have you always understood, you know, your? Uh, identity as an artist socially because in London you worked at a communal studio that had a gallery that you were involved with and certainly through your teaching and in Trinidad through Studio Film Club you've always sought to locate yourself and by default the practice within an idea of a social narrative. Well I've never really thought about it um, that this is what I must do, it's, it's more like this is what I want to do. <laughs> This is what I like doing, and um, have enjoyed that sort of interaction, um, whether it be in studios with other people or, as you say, as you mentioned, teaching. But it seems like it's, uh, it's, it's a. I don't think it's typical, but it's obviously an interesting counterpoint to the the solitary nature of the studio and when you're working. Yeah, I think I get. I realize that um, I need that sort of input. Um, maybe not so much into my work, but into my life, really. Um, at this point, let's uh, sort of open it to the, the paintings that are here tonight, or use some of the paintings as a way to talk about other related things. And um, music, I think, has always provided a really extraordinary subtext to your work and to the paintings themselves. And I think specifically how 
we, uh, we all relate to music autobiographically. And um, I think for the catalog of your first survey exhibition in London, which was at the Whitechapel in 1997, my contribution to the catalog was just to publish a list of all the records that Peter had in his studio. Uh, the, the records were always very close and adjacent to the paintings themselves. And certainly my understanding of it was that the records effectively were the soundtrack for the paintings, albeit unheard in the paintings themselves. But I know that, for, you know, for example, a more obvious example is the paintings you made of the audience at a Rolling Stones concert in the late 1970s mm -hmm. in Buffalo, a concert that you attended. And um, more recently, and certainly since you moved to the Caribbean and to Trinidad, Caribbean music, the music of Calypso, the music of Carnival, Steel Pan, plays an important role in both your life and your work. And um, I know it's a very general question, but can you, can you speak to the ongoing relationship with music in the work? And maybe then we can speak specifically to some of the paintings that are mm -hmm. here. Well, I mean, like many artists, I think I need, to, I need to listen to music to be able to paint. I can't paint in silence. I mean, so I've always, I've always listened to music, and um, there's always been, you know, specific music at, at different times that, um, that I would listen to while I'm, while I'm working. Um, going back to Trinidad in 2002, I mean, I knew a little bit about... Um, you know, early, like Clipso from the 60s, from when we lived there because of records that my, my parents had. Um, you know, you, by famous Clipsonians like the Mito, Mighty Sparrow or Kitchener, Nelson. Um, but when I arrived in Trinidad, I was, I became aware of a far greater, um, you know, amount of new, of, of musicians and a whole history of music that I didn't really know about really. and. Um, I found myself sort of delving into that, and I think that um, that there has been some inspiration, yes, in the paintings. Um, we can speak specifically if everyone wants to look to their right and my left. Uh, there's a small painting of a, a black figure with a skeleton visible uh, to the left, um, which is a depiction painting of the Trinidadian musician Winston Bailey who's better known as Shadow, or even better known as the Mighty Shadow. Um, maybe you can just talk about that painting. He died last year uh, in 2018, so the painting reads as a memorial in one straightforward sense. Well, I mean, I think, in, I think that when he died in Trinidad, there was a great, um, a great amount of grieving, because he was uh, a very special figure within um, within music and because um, he, he was a kind of darker force um, amongst singers who sang you know, essentially for the carnival. Um, his music in a sense you know, transcended carnival and also had a greater amount of pathos I think that could be said fairly than uh, a lot of his contemporaries and um, was also quite a social commentator although others are as well, I think that he, you know, the, the breadth of his work covers a lot of, a lot of territory, really, and um, I can't really think of an equivalent um, singer in another society, but within that society, I think he reigned in a way that um, no one else did, and he had, you know, when he performed, he always wore this, um, some sort of configuration of a skeleton, um, so he had a kind of death-like figure, and yet, you know, he did sing about, yes, about the hardships of life, but also about joy and, you know, um, pleasure as well, but um, just a unique figure, really. And the desire to make a painting of him? Well, the last film night that we made was a tribute to him, and... Um, just before he died, actually. We didn't know he was on the way out. But, um, and I made um, a poster for that, uh, for, that, for that event. And I started making the painting before he died. And um, 
it was, um, I mean, just, just huge admiration, really. It was a fan. A fan, yeah. <laughs> That's um, it. <laughs> on one of my trips to Trinidad to visit you, uh, it was shortly after you acquired the, the record collection of a very celebrated uh, Bosco Holder, a very celebrated Trinidadian painter, uh, maybe the most celebrated Trinidadian painter, I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, Trinidadian painter, dancer, choreographer, and actor Bosco Holder, but from his family estate, you acquired his record collection, which was this extraordinary kind of history, a map, a social and cultural and aesthetic and musical history of the Caribbean itself and the multiple diasporas therein. Um, and it seemed to be an extraordinary thing for you to own, to be the new custodian of this incredible archive of Caribbean life and culture. And as you said, the, the studio is never silent. Um, I was just curious about how music, musics, or the specific music of the Caribbean, I mean, how does it affect the character or the tone of the studio when you're working? I mean, because the music, for the most part, is upbeat, even if it's addressing complex social questions. Uh, does this make the studio a happy place? Because <laughs> um, the paintings don't necessarily announce that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's a compliment. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I think sometimes you listen to music and you just listen to... Um, the music, you don't really listen to the lyrics. That's me. I mean, I know some people are the other way around, but um, lyrics aren't always so important to me. And I think if you listen to soca music, um, particularly contemporary soca music, there is a kind of, uh, there's a lot of cliche involved. And um, I don't mind that really. I, I understand that's part of the genre. Um, and I think it's more to do with, um, I mean, the fascinating thing is the way the music is, I'm talking specifically about soca music, carnival music is designed to be listened to repet repeatedly. And the music that, in a sense, gets to you the more it's listened to is the most successful. I mean, collectively, as a society, as well as individually. And I think that, um, I found that when I was making this, these paintings, I was, I actually made myself a long soundtrack of all the, the most current, um, this year's carnival music, and I just, in a way, listened to it on repeat again and again and again, and it became just a, a kind of um, a way of keeping me going. It kind of gave me energy, but it wasn't, doesn't mean I was painting like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of drove me along. And is, is 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 maybe this is too tenuous, but is there any way to draw an analogy between this idea of the? The, almost like the repetitive necessity of that kind of music. Uh, you, with what I think is interesting, and I think interesting in the work you've made in the last five years, is that, uh, but you've done this before too, you return to motifs in the work and rework things, and there are variations of images. And I think to my right is a very good example of the two paintings with the man in the wheelchair, that the smaller painting on the right I believe you began 15 years ago. It's true, yeah. And the painting on the left was completed within the last year? Within the last few weeks. The last few <laughs> weeks. The paint's still wet. Both of them, actually, yeah. But can you, I mean, this is a great way, I think, to talk about something that's a recurring uh, approach or strategy in your practice, which is revisiting your own iconography and revisiting or rethinking. We see it also in the two paintings around this corner of Robert Mitchum. A third painting was the same group as shown in New York last year, but just something about this returning to, or the, almost like a deja vu, or a <laughs> reprise, a musical reprise in the painting. Well, I think, you know, as, as, a, as a, an artist, maybe you, or a painter, you really only have so many motifs that you actually find really, um, stronger, just worth, you know, <clears throat> worth continuing with, or, um, I mean, I don't think every painting has to be brand new, really. I think it's, um, 
and you, you, you know, with certain paintings, I think, well, I want to go, I want to go back and try just something else that's going to sort of um, maybe be a little bit different, or maybe give a different, give a different mood, or I, you know, why just give it one shot when you can, you know, have another do it again. But in the case of this one, this is quite different because um, the the image actually came from the front page of the Trinidad newspaper in, I think, 2002, shortly after we moved there. And it was a striking image, I thought, of this kind of Good Samaritan policeman, ironic as that it may seem, helping this, this, this one-legged man, you know, get off the sidewalk onto the, onto the street. And um, I thought it's a troubling, troubling image in some ways, a troubling, a troubling um, subject to deal with. Really, um, how do you how do you paint it with so it doesn't just be, be seem seem like some sort of parody? And uh, I think that's why I struggled um, for so long to sort of um, not just find a way of painting it, but also to, to um, come to terms with it. And I finished a smaller painting um, earlier this year, and then, and then that helped me make the bigger painting. Um, with, other, with other paintings where I've used this, the, gone back to the motif, like the one of the, the two male bathers, um, that's a whole other story in a way, but I didn't want to just leave it at one in a sense. <laughs> I felt that, I just felt that um, it was too good in a way to sort of, <laughs> to, to not carry on. I mean, is it, is it important that the, the narrative origins of some of these paintings are accessible to the audience, an audience, the public, or by the time the, the narrative has been resolved into a painting, well, I think, the the for the story I think that the narratives are really my own narratives, and I think that if I tell them, they, they probably they could come across as quite facile or, like, um, or confused, but um, that's always the, um, the way that uh, my imagery comes about. Um, the male bathers, as an example, um, I was always interested in the fact that Robert Mitchum, the actor, had um, been in Trinidad in the 1950s. He made two movies there, um, and he spent 10 months there. But it's almost impossible in any biography or in any writing to find out what he got up to in the 10 months he was there. Um, but I imagine he probably enjoyed it, because shortly after he returns to America, he records um, um, a Calypso record. I mean, at the time, Calypso, of course, was um, a very, very popular genre, um, you know, before it was superseded by rock and roll. And, um, you know, the first million selling record was not uh, Elvis, it was Harry Belaf Belafonte sings Calypso. So it wasn't as if he was, it was, he was unique. But he made a, you know, a pretty serious record with serious cover versions. Like he obviously knew what, he knew what was good at the time. And um, I, Googled um, Robert Mitchum in Trinidad, and this picture came up of a young, very strapping Robert Mitchum, <laughs> obviously not in Trinidad, more like in Coney Island, probably at the age of uh, 18, not the age of 56. <laughs> so I used this as my starting point, and um, I thought about him sort of appropriating this um, genre of music that really had absolutely nothing to do with his his DNA at all, I don't imagine. And how, um, if you go back in the history of Calypso and um, um, Trinidadian music, it's all deeply rooted to how the culture evolved from its very difficult colonial past. And um, I thought of him, not, not as a critique of him, but just this idea of this, this person sort of coming and taking, really. And I thought, in a way, that's possibly what I'm doing. <laughs> so in a way, it was just a, it was a question, really. The, the, the painting was a question as to what's, you know, what's appropriate, really. So is it possible or tempting to read the Robert Mitchum figure as you? 
<laughs> well, I hope so, but <laughs> no, not, not in that way, but as, as, a, as a stand-in. <laughs> uh, you mentioned it, so I'll mention it, but you, you, know, you, you talked about you know, the complicated origins of Trinidad and its people and its, its life and its history, and you also alluded to you know, that there's a complicated relationship for yourself in relation to that history and narrative too. Um, how does the activity of painting, making paintings, thinking about paintings, how does that help you process some of those conversations and questions that you have with yourself? Well, I mean, I hope that... Hello? So, okay. Well, I hope that the paintings, you know, ask questions and maybe sometimes ask uh, difficult questions. Um, I don't want to just be the painter of, you know, hummingbirds and palm trees, which I, you know, could be. <laughs> um, so, I think that the paintings, uh, I think for people who are really looking and people who, you know, care about the culture, but maybe not just Trinidad, but the, you know, a bigger, bigger picture of the world, then there are questions in the paintings. Um, of course, a lot of them are personal questions, but um, I do think of them as being questioning things. <laughs> I think, um, especially within this group of paintings and the, the paintings that you showed in New York and London last year, uh, this yellow building uh, is a recurring image, symbol, motif. And in the painting on the very back wall uh, to my left, the smaller of the two paintings, uh, which has an island in the background and a figure in the foreground painting. Uh, both the island in the background and the yellow structure here are both prisons, uh, real places in and off the coast of Trinidad. The, the island is Carrera Island? Carrera, yes. Which is, um, what's the prison in San Francisco called? Alcatraz. Alcatraz, rather like Alcatraz in the sea. And I mean, the paradox about the yellow structures on the Frederick Street prison is right in the middle of Port of Spain. Correct. Um, I was recently in South Bend in uh, the United States, and they also have a prison right in the middle of downtown. It's really disconcerting when you're going for dinner or to the movies, and the prison's there, but the prison's there in the center of Trinidadian life. And uh, these two places, recur in your work, and they recur especially in this recent work, and I think it speaks to what you were just saying about the idea that, you know, your hope is that the work is not just a, a vehicle for you questioning yourself, but it's to raise questions or to address more complex realities. But could you say something about the painting behind us, but also about Carrera Island and... Uh, yeah, well, Because these aren't symbolic spaces, they're real spaces. Yeah, I mean... When I went to Trinidad with um, Chris and Lisa, and s we were taken out in a boat, and we sailed by this, this island, and um, amongst other islands, and I took, took many photographs of this island, and it turned out to be the island of Carrera, which is the island that Matthew just described. It's, um, it's, a, it's a prison for lifers and people who are on death row. I mean, there's, there's, there's no real death row, but there are people there who are there for life. Anyway, I put this paint, I put this prison um, island in quite a number of paintings um, that I made around that time. And um, I always found it, thought it was a kind of, you know, beautiful but sort of haunted place for obvious reasons. Ten years, um, Ten years later, I was um, in a, a shopping mall in Port of Spain, and there was an exhibition um, of paintings by prisoners from Carrera. And I was surprised that um, the prisoners were there themselves, standing next to their paintings. And so I got talking to them and um, looking at their work, and I was in interested in what they were doing, and then I mentioned to them that I'd made a painting of Carrera, and they suggested that I talk to the, this woman who um, has been 
sort of like, she's like their sort of mentor. She's been working with these guys for th over 30 years, um, teaching them mainly sort of meditation and yoga, but also sort of finding a space for, <coughs> excuse me, space for them to paint. And so she invited me to come to the island, and so I thought it was an invitation I couldn't resist, really, especially since I felt I owed it to, to them, considering I'd painted this place from such a distance. And so I, um, I went and um, talked to them about um, you know, their work and also about, um, tried to talk about my work, which I found quite difficult. Um, tried to talk, tried to give them some sort of inspirational um, talk, but it, I found it quite difficult because they were never going to leave. And so their, their whole agenda for making art was very, very different than say my own or my, my students at Dusseldorf at the time. Subsequently, I've been um, continued to keep in touch with them, and I have helped them mount exhibitions of their work. Um, when they come to Port of Spain for the exhibitions and they're allowed to leave the island, they spend the night here, <laughs> um, which is a pretty grim place. I mean, we, 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 we know people who've um, spent time there, and it's not, not nice at all. Um, but it is right in the center of town, as Matthew said, and it's painted yellow. Too, it's painted right? yellow. It's, it's, sometimes it's almost like Coleman's mustard yellow, and sometimes it's more beige, sometimes it's Naples yellow, but it's, it's kind of like the Brooklyn Bridge. They keep on repainting it. And so it is actually quite a striking object, but I think what's also striking is that, you know, it was built by, or shocking, it was built by the British, and it's one of the few things that the that are, you know, the few things, structures that are really uh, remain of what the British um, left. And, uh, Why do they keep painting it yellow? You think they'd paint it pale gray so that it disappears? Or is it a symbol of no warning? I have no idea, possibly. But one of the things that struck me, um, which must be, must be, well, I know it's true, but when, when the carnival happens, the carnival happens, part of the procession goes past the the prison, and they would never not hear the carnival. So they would not hear the carnival, um, not see the carnival, but they would experience the carnival from their incarcerated position. And, and then in the paintings where the yellow building has a more architectural presence, I know that you and other people have written about references to the paintings of de Chirico, uh, to Van Gogh. Um, are these useful art historical <laughs> anchors or reference points for thinking about the work, or are they just present through the way that you've absorbed art history? I think it was, De Chirico was useful because um, I thought that it was, I don't know, just as a sort of um, way of presenting quite a lot of information on a flat, in, a, in a flat space. I, I, I went back to it there as well. But I don't think it's, you know, it's, not, it's a different time. It's got nothing to do with de Kirchhoff, really. It's got nothing to do with Van Gogh. I mean, it was, it was more just a coincidence, really. And have you had an opportunity to show your work in Trinidad? I mean, there, there, are, there aren't museums in the way we might understand it no, here. No, unfortunately not, really. I mean, I have shown my work in, in my studio, and I have been, um, I exhibit in group show situations there um, whenever I can. Um, both Chris Philly and I have shown paintings um, <laughs> in yeah group shows there, but we it would be there's no space to do a, a show like this there, unfortunately. Um, Is that an interesting or a complicated or a liberating context to be working as an artist? Because living it? in New York or living in London, mm. you can or Vienna, you can have too much art. I mean, it's a dilemma, really, because I, I, you know, I would like to show my work properly in Trinidad, not just um, in, in small bits and pieces here and there. Um, I mean, the only way you can, the only way people can see your work is if they come to your studio, really, and people do. But it's 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 different to this. It's so different. Again, it's social. Yeah, I mean, it's social. Um, I mean, there are. I mean, there's a lot of artists working in Trinidad. Um, but there's, 
and there are quite a lot of people painting, but um, the exhibiting of painting is difficult. Right. Um, I know that we now have to wrap it up because they have to move out the chairs before the opening in five minutes, but um, maybe before we close, um, just the recurring image, the final recurring image, which is present behind us of the lion, um, which, you know, within the culture of Rastafarianism has a very specific uh, role, but it almost occupies, it's almost a kind of cliched image. At the same time, it's a very kind of revered image. And the lion, certainly since the work she showed in Venice five summers ago, mm. uh, has remained a persistent character in the work, a persistent presence uh, there moving through the paintings or moving through the scenes. Um, can you just sort of... Well, I was... Um, exactly what you said. I mean, like, um, the lion of Judah or the, the image of the lion is an image that is used in pop culture as much as it is in sort of, you know, by those who are totally devoted in another way to it. And um, I found that very interesting. Um, and, you know, one sees graffiti of, of lions. Um, it's almost like a stand-in for a Christ-like figure, I suppose, um, within certain parts of uh, the society. Um, I was taken by the lion because there's a zoo in Trinidad, which is a very old-fashioned zoo. It hasn't changed much since um, when I was there as a child. And the architecture is actually very similar to the architecture of the prison, I noticed. And so I had this, and the lion's pacing up and down the, uh, the, their cells or their cages made me think of the prisoners. And um, it was just that type of analogy, really. And, um, and then thinking of the island as a place <laughs> where so certain people can, can never escape, really. So even if they're on the outside of the walls, they're still stuck. Maybe that's a perfect place to leave it, stuck on an island. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Peter, I'd like to thank everyone at the secession for the invitation to be here and enjoy tonight's opening, all three exhibitions. Thank you very much.